Hello and welcome to the Refraction Talk on Struggle and Success, Pride in Countries Where LGBTIQ is Illegal or a Taboo. I am Marceline and I'm an activist and academic from Malta and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. We have an interesting panel lined up for you. Um, uh, we have Christian Halakov from Bulgaria, and we have Mohshin Shafi from Pakistan, and we may be joined later by Ed Hansen from Ghana. So I'll start by telling you a bit about Chris and Mohshin. So Christian Chalakov, Chris, is an illustrator from Plovdiv, Bulgaria. He's known for his style and aesthetic that combines elements from Bulgarian and Balkan folklore, communist propaganda, pop culture, and above all, the queer culture. His art is all about telling stories, and we look forward to hearing some of those stories um, uh, that his art tells. He creates characters, bringing representation to marginalized groups and their experiences across his home country in Bulgaria. We then have Moshin. Moshin Shafi is an interdisciplinary artist living and working in Lahore in Pakistan. His work focuses on the intersectional relationships between tradition, modernity, culture, religion, and sexuality, and on the propensity of these ideas to collectively produce and perpetuate institutionalized oppression and domination. His work is also informed by his encounters with gender representations and with dissident reflections, all the while navigating notions of culture and identity and paying close attention to the transformative masculine and feminine identity, whilst articulating their struggles within the local religious and social cultural contexts. His practice in other mediums further takes advantage of personal archives, offering multiple perspectives that reveal entrenched socio-political contradictions in Pakistani society. In his process, he's seeking to create non-colonial gestures to enact healing, rebalance and repair from the colonialism. He's interested in the role of art in social change, transformative healing and collective justice. And we look forward to hearing about these. So, Chris, maybe if we start with you, could you give us, as, a, as I mentioned, the title of the talk is Struggle and Success, but let's start with a positive note. So maybe you could tell us a bit about um, successes in your work in relation to LGBTIQ and pride in Bulgaria. Chris. Hello, first, uh, thank you for inviting me and also hello to you and hello to the people that are going to listen to our talk. Well, the successes, I think, are more than the, the bad stuff that happened around the queer art. The successes mostly focus around creating this uh, really nice um, like network of people that my art was able to connect to. Like, um, because, of this, because my art combines and focuses on this intersectionality between Balkan and Slavic culture. So in, in both cases, I was able to create a lot of new friends, fellow artists and other people from all around the world, either with Slavic or with uh, Balkan heritage, that they saw something from themselves in my art, which was like kind of inherent, but also I cherish it a lot. So the successes mostly focus around people sending me really like uh, touching messages about how they saw like, yeah, they saw themselves in my art, also how they, they were pleasantly surprised about the whole um, combination, let's say, that I used between the tradition and 
seeing it from the queer lens. So I think this was the biggest thing that kind of uh, motivates me even more and inspires me even more. And also um, it's like this really nice snowball effect of things that I started from one small thing, like um, for example, the, the 2nd of February in Bulgaria is celebrated as the day of the man. So back in the days, it was about the, like the male children in the family, like the sons, and they will like slaughter a rooster so the sons of the family can be healthy. But with time, for some reason, I'm not sure what, maybe it's some kind of old Balkan joke, this day turned into the, the, the day of the gays. So for many years, the meaning went really different. And for example, it was the worst day to be in school because if you seem even slightly queer, they will definitely make fun of you. So my first uh, artwork mixed with uh, the queer culture was exactly this, like uh, a tradition, like a man in traditional uh, Slavic uh, wear. He was putting on a red heel because my whole joke was after he did everything that his parents were in the like the heritage was making him do, then he's ready to put on his heels and go to party. And from this on, it's, it was like the snowball effect of discovering other traditions uh, and also focusing not only on the Bulgarian bubble, but more on like a larger scale of the Balkans and some interesting pockets of the Slavic culture. And with this, of course, came like meeting new people and a lot of nice successes and a lot of, and it basically led to the exhibition in Malta, which was, which was a really nice, another like small pocket of joy connected to the art. So yeah, that was it. Thank you, Christian. So really you're saying that, that uh, your, your, your successes, your, your joys, if you like, is having your art appreciated and recognized and um, through the art meeting other people, other like-minded um, or like-spirited people. And that's, uh, that's, always, uh, that's always great and it's always a, um, uh, I was gonna say a comfort, I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, it, it, it does make us feel better when we are. And it's like in one way, the essence of community basically connecting to people that are like-minded and you appreciate each other and you connect. So Moxin, if you had to tell us a bit about your successes um, in relation to your art, in relation to the work that you do in, in, in your country, in Pakistan. Yeah, I would, um, I would like to, of course, start by thanking you, of course, for uh, having this session with us. Marceline, and of course, I really want to thank Bob for arranging all of this exhibition and this session. So thank you for inviting me and having me here. Uh, to start about um, the successes about as an artist, as a Pakistani queer artist, I would say that it, it of course, um, it's, um, it's fruitful in a way because uh, when, when you look uh, towards the life that you're living, uh, which, which is a very different uh like you know from uh, within a perspective of just like struggling with it every day but then creating something out of those struggle and narrating a personal story which reaches out to the audience who can relate with us and uh, also can just like look at it from various perspectives because um i feel that um and for any artist i think the success is basically uh finding the right kind of audience or just like viewership. Um, and I feel that most of the queer artists who are living in a country like Pakistan or other countries where it's still not okay to be gay or queer, I feel that for us, the successful stories are all about just um, accidentally maybe meeting uh, curators or like, you know, exhibition uh, spaces are just viewers, like I said, who are interested to hear those stories. 
uh, in this case, of course, like I, I would say that it's, 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 it is also a very successful story with like how, uh, you know, because I've been just like, I would say internet is such a great kind of medium where I've been just like following Bob or maybe Bob have been following me on Instagram and we've been just like, you know, following each other as queer artists and, you know, just like he posted about this exhibition that he's looking for artists and I just like randomly like you know, messaged him uh, that is he like also looking for Asian artists and then he said yes but then I totally forgot to just like actually write back and then maybe he saw my practice and then he reached back to me again you know uh, that if I'm interested and of course I got thrilled so I think that also makes a very successful story uh, to begin with because sometimes you you're just like living in your bubble and you're not thinking about that how you can cross that cocoon and uh, these um, like these kind of mediums that we have for instance in 2021 like internet itself I feel it's it, it's it's a successful medium for an artist to somehow reach through their voice and putting it across like not just like nationwide but maybe internationally and that's what i consider a success i can mention indeed you you you're very right that um uh, the internet has completely changed uh, the way that, that we that we communicate that we are able to reach across as you say reach across the the miles and the the, the, the waves and the um, uh, the land to 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 other people and in relation to um, LGBTIQ and and pride um, uh, I, I think again hearing about other countries um, uh, where things are better gives hope. And um, uh, hearing about other countries where things are worse um, is uh, is very sad. It's it's it's, it's um, it reminds us that um, uh, you know it's not a matter of well we're okay here and uh, you know thank you Jack, um, uh, but that um, uh, you know, we, we we need to continue working um, uh, further. And uh, it's it's. Uh, I am not an artist. I will I will say. Um, so I find it very interesting to see um, uh, artists like yourselves working through your art to 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 bring the message across, to tell stories, as you as you said, to to try to promote um, uh, healing and um, uh, you know transformation and social change. Um, uh, Maybe you can tell us also a little bit about that, um, uh, Moshin. I know that you, you in your in in the introduction, I mentioned that you 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 like to to use through your process. You, you're looking to create um, uh, healing, rebalance, repair, and social change, etc. Yeah, I I feel that. Um, uh... I think one, I mean, of course, uh, there, there's this um, thing about the, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, one is the restriction of the state that that comes to certain countries. But then, for instance, living in, in a country where religion itself is such a, don a dominant thing, I feel that it's not just the society, but also the religion that you're fighting with somehow. Um, and uh, I feel that lots of people not really get into the depth of reading the religion itself uh, because I was born and raised in a Muslim uh, family and uh, I would say the way that religion is being taught in Pakistan is actually uh, from a very kind of stereotypical uh, way that maybe like the most of the people don't really get to read it itself because the Quran like is written in Arabic and the language that we speak is Urdu. So lots of people just like uh, verbally just like read it, but they don't really read the trans translation version of it actually. Um, and it's kind of, I always as a growing up, you know found it really intriguing because of course you know as a teenager when when you kind of discover that you're different from other kids and you know you're dealing with the idea of identity sexual identity you i think the first thing is that you're trying to figure out i mean if you belong to a society where i belonged like you know where religion of course was such a mainstream 
a center of the livelihood. I looked into it and I just was not finding any references, um, you know, uh, where homosexuals, people were kind of, uh, you know, defined or like, you know, I told about in the last book anyway. And then I, I, I got into it, like in terms of like getting into the translation, reading various versions and you know summarizing it through and i found that there were some stories that were narrated to a particular tribe that exists of course like you know at that time period but there wasn't anything i particularly could found which directly says anything about uh, like against homosexuals and and i feel that lots of people somehow just don't really uh, get into the detail of it. Because I see a lot of like gay Muslim men in Pakistan struggling with the idea of sexuality, but not really getting into the detail of knowing that what it's all about, um, you know. And um, and I feel that with my work, I mean, I think that's that's more like an awareness that I want to bring through because I'm an 80s born kid and I think at that time things were done in a very different way. So for instance, like most of the gay men that I I know personally in Pakistan, uh, they're married to women right now because, you know, because of the peer pressure, because of like, because of the joint family system that we have. Uh, I mean, they do, of course, kind of experience being sexual with other men in their early teens or early 20s but then because of the pressure when the, when a certain age comes they end up just like marrying women because of that pressure uh, and also because they think that it's not right in Islam because they don't really get into the deep knowledge of it itself and I think they make it a barrier um, and I think what I through my work, I'm trying to break through those cliches, those ideas. And in terms of like healing, I feel that it's, it's, I mean, it's not necessary for me, at least that if, if it's reaching, my work is reaching out to like thousands of people or like hundreds of people. But I guess that even a one person who is in a, like in a state of confusion or denial where he's just like putting everything on religion that oh because i'm muslim you know and it's not right to be like a gay man or i'm going to go to hell because of that i feel that if he understands and if he gets something out of my work then then it's a success for me and that's the that's the process of healing another soul you know just letting them know that this is who you really are because i think most of the time most of the people just tend to hide their identity, hiding their true self because of the society and what the society tells you to be instead of just accepting who they really are. Yes, I can, I can fully understand that. Um, uh, you say you're an 80s um, uh, child. I'm a 50s child. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, and indeed, I mean, the, the, although we are Catholic, Roman Catholic in Malta, the the church played um, uh, in you know, much less now, of course, than, than before. But it did play a very strong, dominant role. And it was uh, it was uh, the, the message was that uh, if you practice homosexuality, then you would end up in hell. So the hell the hell is still there. Christian, what about um, what about Bulgaria? How does um, how does religion play a role there? Well, here religion is it's interesting to follow it because if we see like the um, the Bulgarian Renaissance time, let's say the times around the liberation from the Ottoman Empire, religion was the basically the driving force around the idea of freedom, the idea of independence. But then when Bulgaria got under, like, uh, under the socialist and the communist times, uh, as we know, religion was not a thing. So people were put again in similar situation when they were going, like they were not going to churches, they were celebrating uh, religious uh, holidays, like hidden because you don't know what your neighbor is going to tell you because of the national, what was it called? Like the, like not national service, but basically the spies, because you 
you didn't know if your neighbor is going to tell on you that you're performing this. And nowadays, it's a, it's a strange mixture between what they used to be and what it's now. To be honest, religion nowadays, I think by the books, it's something important here, but in actuality, it's not that big. Uh, I think it's because there was a big scandal of a lot of the main, uh, like, uh, main people in the biggest monastery here. Uh, they were either involved in, uh, they were part of the Bulgarian mafia, or they were part of the, like, the national security that was telling on other people. And recently, like, to mix this with the with the queer topic, recently there was this really big scandal about. Uh, like basically the similar thing that happens to the Catholic Church and how it's like uh, its relationship with like young men and and kids and yeah there was this big scandal but it's interesting because Bulgaria because of history has this really strange relationship to religion like for I think few of my relatives they don't they don't celebrate anything because they're from that culture they're born in communism, religion was not a big thing. On, on the other side, are like my family that was, I think in Bulgaria, let's say to keep it more simple, it's culturally, we are Christians, like Orthodox Christians, but we're not very good at practicing it. Like a lot of other Balkan things, it's a bit dysfunctional, <laughs> let's say. Yeah, like if you ask someone, are they like religious, they'll be Yes, of course I am. Like, for example, now because we're doing the national, like uh, we count the, I was called the population. Uh, one of my friends he even told me how when the lady came to like put down his information and everything, she was asking him, "Are you religious?" And he was saying, "No, I'm not." And she was like, "But you should. Like, how come you're not?" No, no, no. Let's put it down that you are. So it's 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 funny. I think it depends on the person. So, so what would you say? Um, uh, um, what would you say then is the is the main sort of dominant, if you like, reason for um, Bulgaria not being very gay friendly? Well, I think it's uh, the main thing. Probably is the idea that being gay or being uh, queer or being anything else that the uh, uh, than patriarchal and like mm -hmm. yeah. heteronormative, uh, there is this idea that everything comes from the West. So it's like, it's it was not here, someone brought it from somewhere. That's why I was actually, that was my main focus in my art to show characters that are actually local and the, that they're here. Because they did the research about uh, being part of LGBTQ in, in the Soviet times because the history has a lot of other places. It's almost completely erased. And before that, no one knows, like before the communist times. As we know, of course, there were like queer people, but by, by the documents, there were no. So, so I think that's the main reason. The idea that uh, it's from somewhere else before uh, before like uh, the changing of the regime, there were no gay people in Bulgaria. There was no such a thing. So I think that's that's the main thing. And the in this simply the whole mindset, I think, of the Balkan Slavic mindset that that is very um, not only patriarchal but also very like um, like very masculine, very machismo type of mindset. I think that's that's the main thing. I think it's very interesting the the, the the couple of things that you said because they kind of interlink but it's they are also very different. And like I mentioned earlier, of course, about being like you know being born in 80s and all of that. I think that's uh, that also connects with this idea that it's so interesting that um, 
like in my part of the region like in subcontinent uh which of course is like and i'm i'm saying like subcontinent for, of india like you know which includes like you know uh, india uh, current india and sri lanka bangladesh and all of these other countries uh before uh, we were colonized by the britishers there was no law so like you know about homosexuality and we are actually the region where transsexuality for instance exists from thousand of years i mean we have a major major history of like having transsexuals like in our culture um you know and there was never a rule against that and even about like homo like you no know, homosexual relationships they were kind of actually okay if you would get to read the history uh, of like subcontinent of india you would find out that there was no rule and it was i mean maybe of course it was considered not like a great thing you know but there was no rule I and mean, people could just be themselves i mean if you read the mughal empire history and everything and even if we go before that like where i'm talking about like 1300 century 1400 century where lots of like amazing sufi writers from the from sub east uh, asia have written their poetry where they have crossed these uh, notions of gender uh, while writing these poetry a lot of which i also use in some of my practice you know in terms of like uh, in some of the video works that i've done and some of the performative pieces or artist books i that i made and it's very interesting how they are talking about gender with no barrier like in maybe in the same poem in the first stanza the 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 writer the the sufi poet is basically calling himself like a male like you know as a I mean, you know as a male version but like in the second stanza he is the female you know and it's so interesting that how there are no barriers about that um so one part is that and then it's the way like you no know, how things change after the partition after colonization and how religion became such an important thing for instance for us pakistanis in 1947 but when pakistan was made as a country on the name of religion for instance uh, and as you mentioned about like your religious places and we all know about the history of like christian uh, like you know uh, churches about the priests and their relationship with the kids the same thing is has been happening over the years in pakistan with the mosque and like young guys being raped uh, even within the vicinity of mosques and it's it's so bizarre that you know nobody's talking about it like you know in now in the media of course from couple of years that now do we do have some kind of in, like i would say like media like independent so like in terms of like freedom of speech i would say where they're talking about like sexual harassment of these kids done by like a religious islamic scholars but like when i was growing up as a child like you know or even until my 20s for instance i never listened to these kind of stories but these stories have existed and they are existing more and more now because you see a frustration of course so i don't know how much of that you can say that oh this is they they are not really homosexual themselves or are, is it just like msm like men having sex with men so it's such a clash with within a society where it's a masculine society it's a very macho society but the, it, at the same time these acts are being done you know uh um, you know on these small kids in terms of like being sexual with them so i i find all of these contrasts very bizarre as well as very contradictory in my society yes um uh, and 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 again it's 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 interesting because what we're saying here is that uh, in relation to to chris to to um uh, to bulgaria um uh, queerness is seen as something which the west has imposed on us the west has brought in on us because we are not like that we are not like that but it's the west and their fancy ideas their silly ideas and they are these are being you know absorbed by us or imposed on us or whatever um uh, on the other hand in relation to um uh, historically um uh, in the in the subcontinent at the asian subcontinent as you are, as you are saying mosse it was not an issue it was not an issue it was only when the colonialist um rule came in with the um uh, queen victoria's um uh, criminalizing of well, not her but in her time criminalizing um homosexuality um and indeed there are many many places within the commonwealth ex british colony where 
Um, the law is still there, the law against homosexuality, which came in the time of the Queen Victoria, and indeed with some very dire consequences. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, but then again, after the British, then it was the religion. And that's also interesting because often it is, um, I mean, in Malta historically, again, it is said that uh, the religion acted as a, as a, like a, like a, like a fort, like a castle, if you like, against the colonialists. So to, to, and it was the religion that maintained the Maltese identity. And similarly, the, the, the religion in, in Pakistan then became the, the, the uniting factor, if you like, that, um, uh, you know, uh, we are what we are. We are not English. We are not. Uh, right. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you, Chris, because um, uh, as I said, the the title, if you like, of this uh, talk is struggle and success, and maybe in relation, especially to to pride, in in countries where LGBT. IQ is is uh, is illegal or it's a, a taboo. And uh, what would you say is are, are the struggles that that uh, you are facing and LGBTIQ issues are facing in, in Bulgaria? Well, it's funny because the issue here, when it comes to pride, it's kind of a continuation of the previous uh, topic that we were speaking about, with the whole mindset of what it's uh, like. Uh, Authentical, what it's brought from outside, because in Bulgaria, the most most of the people, even a big amount of the people from the LGBTQ community, they don't trust the pride as a form of protest. Because in Bulgaria, even though we say that, like the old people, they say that, um, like the people from different generations, they call, uh, they say that it's something from the West. Uh, they kind of they decide to be very picky when it comes to the tools that they use and the language they use when it comes to being anti-LGBTQ. For example, they don't like the pride as a form because in Bulgarian language, uh, parade, like pride parade, uh, in Bulgarian language, parade is something that they um, associate with Soviet times, like the parade of the army, like the parade of like all of these old traditions that like a few minutes before we were saying that they kind of still cherish some of the people. So everyone who wants to like, it, it's funny because it's a bit like, a, it's a clash of uh, ideas. So because of this, of course they pulled the whole card of, oh, like, I don't want you to parade your sexuality. No one needs to see like you parading your sexuality. Uh, it's like, I think pride in Bulgaria is the, like the favorite topic of some of the gossip, uh, like comedians, because it's always the same, like the pride will come, like June will come, everyone will start to like, uh, speak about it. And, uh, in Bulgaria, every year we have I, I, at least two or three contra, like against the pride, like small protests. Some of them are. Uh, by this nationalist group. The other one is uh, like by the evangelist group for the traditional family and they have like their small march, which we always find funny because I think almost every year they use balloons in the colors of trans pride flag, which we always find funny, but oh well. So the view on the pride is a bit, even, even to queer people, it's a bit oh yes, but I don't want people to like present it like this. It's it's funny because it's it has problems even like internal between the queer people and their view on how it should be done, why it's even here, like why we celebrate it. Like the shortest way that I usually describe it to people that are either questioning me about it, like asking me about it, or they are very like... Uh, they don't, they don't see it as something important. I always say, instead of calling it like the gay parade, just switch the break with protest and you might be a bit closer to what we 
want to do. Because the whole idea of, even with the idea of protest, uh, in the last few years, it got to be more like a form of resistance. It got to be more cherished, especially with the uh, very big governmental protests in the past year and a half, I think. And also we had like the students protests a few years back. So I think this form of resistance, uh, I think it skipped, maybe it skipped a generation and now it's making its way back. So that's why people, they don't see it as protest or like and they always ask oh but why do you do it like you have all the rights that everyone else in Bulgaria has but we all know that it's it's not it's not actually this even the basic one when it comes to like violence due to homophobia or transphobia or some kind of like uh, discrimination on a gender or sexuality based yeah it, the good thing is, this year it was a record when it comes to attending the Pride. So we were, the energy was very different. I'm really happy because I, I was at Sofia Pride two years ago or three years ago. I, because of COVID, I have no idea. It was some years ago. So, and the energy was totally different. Like people were there, but they were not sure exactly why they're there. But now three years later, you see how the people who were 12 then they were 15, they're 15 now so the whole like uh, enthusiasm and the whole vibe was totally different it was i think around 10,000 people this year and and it was it was exactly what it's supposed to be like it was a lot of people with a lot of positive energy and and in the end because it was raining we had a gigantic rainbow that it was actually on top of the one of the big government's uh, buildings. So it was kind of a like a sign, like get the note. So, so yeah, this I think it's very progressive. But so far, the LGBT community, they see it as something positive. They see it as, in a lot of ways, like protests, like a day to celebrate, uh, like the community and to show people that because the problem is, as we know, in a lot of places, when they speak about pride, especially in the media, they will always nitpick some kind of very provocative shot from some kind of either the Folsom um, parade or something that it's very, very explicit, which in Bulgaria, you don't get it. Like people, they bring their, their children. I always write under like the comments. Uh, I always say, don't worry, Bulgaria is still at least a few hundred years back from this. Like, don't worry, we're not there. It's not going to happen. But of course, this is this usually opens another topic. And I think in like in a comparison to the Western media, when they like they usually say that it's something Western, the people in the West they don't comment uh, comment it like this. They even have the discourse about is kink allowed and pride or not which in comparison to people who like they criticize the the classic form of protest with people going and celebrating it's it's funny to me yeah but like long story short bulgarians are as usually very divided of their opinions to pride and we'll see we hope that every year it will be better and more colorful and happier and people will start to get the idea but it's good that the last one, as you said, this last one has been a, a, a huge success. So that is something positive, definitely. Uh, Moshi, in relation to, to Pakistan and the, the, the struggles, the struggles. Yeah. Is, is, is there anything specific that you, you would like to um, ask? Well, the title is The Struggle and Success, um, uh, Pride in countries where lgbtiq is uh, yeah no i i meant in terms of like just being a queer person or, or just being an artist but I'll, I'll 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 talk about both um i i feel that in a country like pakistan i think it's a it's an everyday struggle uh to just be a queer man anyway because uh of course you can't be really out and about and it's a very uh i would say like a 
like every person who is queer, who is gay, who is lesbian maybe, uh, they have like this kind of uh, double kind of life, I would say. And it's a, it's a major struggle when every day you have to wake up and you have to pretend a very heteronormative at, at your workplace, like, you know, you're going, so you're just like, you know, you're just like being aware of every single thing, you know, for instance, that what you're wearing, how you're talking, you know, I mean, I, I used to have like a, like a nine to five job before, for instance. So I like, think there's certain kind of like, you know, uh, wardrobe that one, one has to have. So it, it, you, you have to be like really particular about like, you know, how you look like that people don't get like an idea that you're, you're different. So I would say that it's a major struggle on an everyday basis for somebody to, to, to have like a queer life. Like just giving my personal example, for instance, like I'm wearing this like nose pin ring and I can't get my nose pierced. So this is like a, this is like a ring which can just get off basically. And I can just wear it while maybe I'm meeting like a, very close circle of two, three friends, but then I can't wear it in within my own home, you know, because like, you know, I live in a joint family. So like, what would people consider? I have a long hair, for instance, so I can't really just be myself. I have to wear like a cap every day to hide my long hair so that I don't really get to have uh, listen to the comment. Uh, but because I'm an artist, I'm, I'm very expressive. So I need to find an alternative way to express myself, even if it's for an hour, even if it's for like, like three hours, even if for like a day, you know. So uh, I think it's a major struggle to just be a gay, queer, lesbian person in Pakistan because you're constantly hiding. You're hiding from your family, you're hiding from your friends, you're hiding from your colleagues. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it is a major struggle. And then being an artist, being a queer artist, I think it's, it's again a major struggle because you are being restricted uh, towards uh, visual uh, narratives that you're making. Like for instance, I can't, uh, I can't like show nudity. I can't really talk about sexuality in a very open kind of way. So I have to think about the symbols which still says about my sexuality, which talks about gender, which talks about equal rights, but they have to be hidden even when, within my work. And then like, you know, a person like me, artists who somehow got lucky to maybe exhibit my work, of course, abroad, it's, it's, it's different because the work that I, I'm actually making, I cannot show that within my own country, but I'm able to showcase it in the countries outside. Um, which doesn't bring any pride to me, which actually makes me uh, like really like confused as an artist, which makes me actually feel bad as an artist because I feel that, oh, my own country doesn't give me this right. So I'm showcasing this work to another country, um, you know, and as a maker that raises a lot of question. Uh, so I think these struggles are just like very ongoing struggles. And the sad part is that I don't think that they're going to come to an end because, you know, I live in a country where religion is so important. That's not going to change. And uh, ironically, it's actually becoming more and more and more extremist, like day by day. Um, you know, like, for instance, our prime minister came on the mainstream TV when Taliban took over Afghanistan, like just last month and congratulated the whole nation that how happy he is and how, like, you know, we should be thankful that the Muslim, like, you know, the Taliban's are there. So the Islam is going to spread. And I feel that, like, you know, it, it is actually really, really scary for 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 anybody who's different i mean it's not that i'm against islam like i'm a practicing muslim myself i consider myself a liberal muslim but it is these these kind of things are scary and you know these are the struggles that i go through like on everyday basis um in terms of of course like with even with the work that i'm showcasing right now in this exhibition on behalf of what we are having this uh, this conversation there's a struggle of me even just like not within Pakistan, but even outside Pakistan, because because of how I look, because of my skin color, because of the way that I talk, because of my identity as a Muslim, you know, I'm being stopped at the airport for hours. And this particular work that Bob chose for this exhibition actually is, is raising those questions because I've been humiliated like uh, internationally at airports 
uh, specifically for being who I am, you know, the way that I look, I've been asked about my sexuality. I've been asked that, is it like, if I can't be just like gay, gay man, why I am carrying the, you know, these certain objects. So my clothes have been teared apart. My things have been looked into. So I, I, I think that these struggles are just not basis based just within Pakistan, but also like outside Pakistan. And it raises a lot of questions about the way uh, like you know you are like you know and things that you didn't even choose like i didn't choose my my skin color i didn't choose my origin i didn't choose like the way that i look but these things affect on me as a person these things affect on me as an artist and still like you know i'm the one who is still trying to deal with it uh, you know and these struggles seems to be just like not coming to an end <laughs> so it's a uh, so it's like you said i think one of the things that we can we can't just stop we can just carry on with what we have like i feel that artists are gifted people and somehow we have this kind of tool to just like uh, narrate our stories through our mediums so i think that's 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 all i'm trying to do still uh, but the struggles are just non-stop i would say <laughs> Oops. Thank you, Mashin. Um, uh, uh, a very, a very um, uh, clear um, uh, explanation, if you like, uh, regarding the difficulties. And as you say, um, you started off by saying, well, you know, what difficulties as a, as a queer person or as an artist or whatever, but um, uh, these are all part of your identity. So you, really you're saying that there are struggles in every every aspect of your identity because of your religion, because of your um, nationality, because of your skin color, because of you are an artist, because of your sexual orientation, that um, all of these present um, challenges, which you are um, uh, challenging through your work. So well done for that. Um, uh, and Christian as well, of course, is challenging the, 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 the I'm still saying messages by mistake, the machismo, machismo, if you like, um, uh, of the way that um, masculinity is presented in, uh, in Bulgaria, also through his art and uh, also through um, uh, the art that he's also exhibiting in uh, in this uh, exhibition. So um, uh, it's been very interesting, but the time has just flown by, and it's uh, it's time for us to close. So maybe if you could just give us one last comment to to end the the discussion, and we will we will close. Christian, one last comment. Well, maybe it would be to, to, regardless of the successes or like the struggles, we should, especially from the queer point of view, we should always um, focus on the positives and always um, try to, like, even as a motivation, maybe to, um, first of all, to stay safe, regardless of where you are, what you're doing, like, safety is probably the first thing uh, but also to say to stay true to yourself because no matter what you do no matter what you're trying to accomplish if you're not true to yourself even the successes won't be that good they won't be that joyful and, thank you christian yeah sorry uh, <laughs> Yeah, and of course, as last words, to thank you about this discussion, and thanks to Bob for cre uh, curating the the exhibition and bring my art to Malta, and hopefully soon I'll also come to visit because I've never visited Malta, so we'll see. You would be very welcome, I'm sure. Uh, Maxi. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's um, it's um, I think for everybody who's listening, I feel that it's uh, I, I I would also encourage the the queer community, of course, to just like look into the struggles of people who are just living in the countries where. Uh, it's not an easy thing because like because of my travels and you know just like been outside Pakistan. I mean sometimes I feel that queer people 
can take their independence for granted like you know they just don't really value that how lucky and blessed they are to be born and raised in the country where they can just be themselves and express themselves and i have seen them just being like you know unthankful and just uh, making small petty issues such a big deal of their life where they think oh this is like you know end of our life where we can't seem to afford something or we we had this holiday plan and we couldn't just do it you know and this is like the end of our world and it it raises a lot of those questions that how within the queer community they are so um kind of i would say um like not familiar that what's happening with the queer, uh, like no queer community around the globe and how people are struggling uh, to fight uh, to just like live on a daily basis. So I feel that instead of like creating a network of support system and you know they, they're just like talking about those issues which is not even important so i would say that whoever is listening who uh, who who have this kind of luxury to just be who they are and you know just express themselves they should look into the lives of other queer people around the globe and just be a support in any kind of way that they can if they can't just like you know just be there like no i would say in any other way maybe just listen to their stories just give them their little time to hear them you know and that's kind of healing itself uh to just giving you know boring your ears to listen to somebody's struggle somebody's stories uh so i feel that's really important and i think that's my message that i would like to give and uh, in terms of uh, this exhibition of course i really really want to thank bob uh for for coming up with this idea for just thinking out of the box just thinking to include people and doing something so uh, major in in malta i think it's also like really huge for malta queer community to actually uh, come across these stories from people, uh, from artists around the globe. And um, I see it as a major, major success, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, just spreading the stories and spreading the love around. Uh, so, of course, I want to thank Bob for that. And thank you so much for, for, for you to moderate us and just listening to us and, you know, accommodating us for this session. Well, that means we're completely out of time. So all I will do is say thank you, Chris. Thank you, Moxin. Thank you, Bob, of course, for the whole thing. And um, goodbye. Goodbye.